Hey everyone, Caroline Friday, Neighborhood Bible Study. We're in now in chapter 15 of the book of Matthew, and we've seen all the wonderful miracles that Jesus has performed, how he has fed the 5,000 plus the women and the children, which was probably about 20,000 people, how he's walked above the wind and the waves, how he's delivered people and healed them, and all kinds of wonderful things. And the multitudes are thronging him and longing for him to heal all their loved ones and they're, they were embracing him. And you can also look at one of the other Gospels and you can see that after he fed the 5,000 that they wanted to make him a king. They knew that one greater than Moses had come because he had fed them in the wilderness, so to speak, in a way that Israel had never seen. They had, they had eaten the manna after they fled Egypt, but this was very different from manna. This was the fish and the loaves multiplied abundantly, and then there was a great abundance left over. And I don't think the leftovers meant that there were half-eaten loaves and half-eaten pieces of fish. No, leftovers meant there were baskets full of fresh bread and fresh fish that no one ate because they were full. And so that, that food would have blessed other people. So this was something, this was a sign. It was a sign from God that this Jesus of Nazareth was the anointed one that had been promised in Scripture, greater than Moses, new covenant, uh, a new heart where God would write his laws on the hearts of his people and he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And we know he did that on the day of Pentecost. But now we always, there's a pattern here because every time Jesus does these wonderful things and he is proving by action not only by words, but by action, that he is the anointed one. You always have the rulers of the synagogue and the Pharisees and the scribes that come right behind challenging him because he is not living up to their standard or their expectation of uh, who they think Messiah is. Why isn't he doing this as the elders do it? Why is he doing that? Why is he working on the Sabbath? Even though that work is not toiling, it's helping people. He has compassion on people. He sees people afflicted by demons, and he sees a man with a withered hand. He sees those with leprosy who need deliverance. He's not the kind of Savior who says, you need to wait till Monday morning or wait till 6 p.m. on Saturday night so that I can heal you. He has compassion, and he does it immediately. He's a now God. And they don't understand that. Why would you Why would you do that? And so we see that again in chapter 15. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. There was a ceremonial washing that was a tradition of the elders, and they, the disciples were not doing that. Now, I had always thought, in my mind, I had always, and maybe it was from movies, that the Pharisees were coming very angry and very stern and very forceful and demanding to know why Jesus wasn't fulfilling the law and, and uh, adhering to all the traditions. But as I was studying this this morning, I got a different perspective. I And I can't prove this, but perhaps these Pharisees came very, uh, very much uh, inquiring. They were curious they had been following him. They were watching him. Maybe some of them were starting to question. And we know that was true because if you go look at the account of the mock trial, there were some who were questioning and said, well, surely he's from God. I mean, who else healed a, a man born blind? Only God can do that. So there's some questioning. They're wondering, is he, could he be the one? And so I believe that these Pharisees maybe came to him inquiring. I almost vision them kind of tapping him in the shoulder very gently and saying, uh, why is it your disciples aren't washing their hands? With, you know, why aren't they doing that? Kind of quietly and, and very, very much, um, very inquisitive as to why Jesus and his disciples are doing that. And here's his answer. He says unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition. And so here is the commandment that's being transgressed according to Jesus and the tradition. God commanded saying, honor thy father and mother. 
And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Okay, so that's the commandment, and here's the curse that comes with it. You're cursed if you don't honor your father and your mother. But verse 5 says, But you say, whatsoever shall, uh, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. All right, that makes absolutely no sense to me unless I go to the Amplified to understand the King James. King James is very confusing there. So I go over to the Amplified, and, and here's what the, uh, the explanation is. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother what you would have gained from me, that is the money and whatever I have that might be used for helping you, is already dedicated as a gift to God then he is exempt and no longer under obligation to honor and help his father or his mother. So, for the sake of your tradition, the rules handed down by your forefathers, you have set aside the word of God, depriving it of force and authority and making it of no effect. So, in the temple system, if you gave to the temple, if you paid some kind of monetary amount to the temple, then according to the tradition of men, you would have satisfied the requirement to honor your father and mother and pay for their whatever they needed medical treatment living expenses etc and so you could kind of wash your hands of your parents and say you know i don't really have to help you i've given at the temple so to speak and the temple will take care of you and let the temple take care of you and god says that's not right God wanted Israel to honor their father and their mother, which meant help them in their old age, provide for them, take care of them. And those of us who are born again, we want to do that for our parents. We don't want to cast our parents off into the streets or put them off into a home and never visit them and just say, well, you know, let the institutions take care of them. Let someone else take care of them. God loves family and he wants us to honor family, mothers and fathers, even the mothers and fathers who have not loved us unconditionally, who may have hurt us. I believe the Heavenly Father wants us to honor our father and mother. He, he does not want us to be in a place where they continue to abuse us. If we're in an abusive situation, emotionally or even physically, the Lord does not want us to stay in abusive situations. But He will show you through the Spirit how to honor your father and your mother in that circumstance and to show love, the love of God, to them. But we are not to cast them away and just say, well, you know, let the church take care of them or let the government take care of them or whatever. That's what was going on here. And Jesus says that by this tradition, which you claim honors the law, you actually violate the law. You violate it, and you make the law of no effect. Your traditions make the law of no effect. He says, you hypocrites, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, God wants our hearts. Our hearts are what God wants. We're getting ready to see that from the heart, one's actions are displayed words uh, that come out of our mouth, that have an effect on our conduct, come from our heart. And you know, people say all the time, oh, well, you don't know someone's heart. Yes, you can know someone's heart. If you observe someone long enough, you can see their heart very clearly by what comes out of their mouth and by their conduct. Both of those things. If people come close to God with their lips and honor him with their words by saying all these wonderful things about God, but then their conduct doesn't line up with those words, then you know you have a heart problem. You have a heart problem. And we are to test the spirits and examine the fruit of all of those who claim to be born-again children of God. We all know there are people sitting in the pews of the churches of North America, many of whom are not born again. They say all the right things, but their conduct is far from what they say. And so um, 
Jesus says, hypocrite, you're a hypocrite. And um, he goes on to say, um, uh, in vain, in vain, they, and these are the scribes and the Pharisees he's talking to, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So they teach all these wonderful doctrines and uh, man-made doctrines that are supposed to help one love God more and maybe even help people sin less and all these wonderful things. But Jesus says it's all in vain, all in vain. And that means no profit. It will not profit, profit you in the least. And he called the multitude and he said unto them, now he's talking to all these people that have thronged him, wanting deliverance and all that. And he says, hear and understand. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth. This defileth a man. And we know he's not talking about vomit. He's talking about words. The words that come out of a man are what defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? So the Pharisees left this exchange extremely offended, very, very upset. Just as there may be people today listening to this and are very offended because they love their tradition, they love their laws, and they love their religion. And so when they hear this, they get very offended because they believe their tradition and their religion and all their works are making them right with God. And they are not. It's all in vain. They are hypocrites. So Jesus answers them in verse 13. He says, every plant. So now he's metaphor speech again. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. What is he saying? He's saying, if plants are men, and we know this is the metaphor that he's giving, these men who claim to be right with God, the scribes and the Pharisees, those who adhere to the traditions of Jewish men, they have not been planted by the Heavenly Father. They have not. They may look godly. Paul says they have a zeal for God. They are zealous for God, but they have no knowledge of God. They have not been planted by the Heavenly Father. They will be rooted up, and they were rooted up in 70 AD. This is harsh speech. This is very harsh. Um, so it's going to be rooted up. Let them alone. He says, let them alone. Don't even bother with them. They be blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. So Peter needs more clarification because Peter is Jewish. Peter has grown up as a Jewish boy and studying the law and the traditions of the Jewish culture. He's confused, as any of us would be in that circumstance. Please explain to us, what are you saying? What are you saying about these Pharisees? You're saying they're not, they haven't been planted by the Heavenly Father. You're saying they're going to be rooted up. You're saying they're, they're, all their actions are in vain. What are you saying to us? And Jesus answers and said, Are you also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever enters in at the mouth, goes into the belly, and is cast out into the draught. In the fleshly body, what we eat, anything we eat physically, it goes into our body, it's processed, and it comes out. Come on, Peter. You understand that. All people understand that. And what he's saying to Peter is, Peter, I'm instructing you on something deeper, something different, not something fleshly. This goes beyond the flesh that decays and dies. This is a spiritual God kingdom with God principles. 
And the truth is this. <clears throat> Those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. So when I read this, my interpretation of the spiritual law at work here is that sin and all the horrible things of the flesh start with our words. They start with what's coming out of our mouth. What are we saying? Those words reflect our heart. Our heart has already been corrupted. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Man is born into sin with a depraved heart. Even though he starts out as a cute little innocent baby, perhaps, and, and, and grows up and is very sweet and lovable and may not be held accountable for his actions because he is a baby. But at some point, the age of accountability comes. He becomes aware of right and wrong, the law, and his sin nature, his depraved heart is revealed by what comes out of his mouth. And then, of course, we know that after that, the actions follow. So really, if you go look at scripture, you'll, you'll see that the thoughts, we are to put the word before us. We are to meditate on the word. We are to look at the word. We are to discuss the word and speak the word. As we do that, as we keep the word in the forefront, it gets into our thoughts and into our mind. And as it gets into our thought and our mind, it gets down into our heart. And as it gets down into our heart, and we, have, we get that new heart. When we get born again, we get a new heart. Our heart is circumcised. Um, the condemnation and the guilt and all that is cut away. We get a fresh, pliable, new heart. God's laws are written on it. We now know what we are to do. We, just, we, have, we have a knowledge, a, a heart knowledge, and then we have a desire to, to do that thing. And then God gives us the ability to, to do what he's called us to do. Um, but once that heart becomes fresh and new, then out of that heart is going to come words that line up with what our heart now consists of. The laws of God, the things of God, the mysteries of God, the wonderful things of God. And as those words come out, our conduct will then follow along with our words. And a classic example is this. Before I got born again, I was terrified of sickness and disease. Back in the 70s, there was a whole lot of movies about people dying of cancer, a story with love story. And then there were all kinds of movies of, uh, you know, people dying of cancer. And then people, um, there was a movie called The Other Side of the Mountain where the skier falls off the mountain and she's um, uh, paralyzed from the neck down. All kinds of tragedies that occur to the flesh and no healing. Medical science can't heal. And of course, there's no discussion of God. I was terrified of getting sickness and getting a disease. And once I became born again and I started studying scripture and I started reading scripture, God started pointing out, it was like it would leap off the page, the scriptures regarding healing. And uh, I know in particular, there was one scripture in Hebrews where God really showed me that I was not to be fearful of sickness anymore because he showed me in those scriptures that Satan, in all my life up to that point, Satan had kept me in fear of death, but that Jesus Christ, my Savior, had delivered me from the fear of death. And when I read that scripture, I believe that's in Hebrews I said Acts a minute ago, but it's in Hebrews uh, either 1 or 2, and we'll go look at that another time. When I read that scripture, I realized, well, yeah, the enemy has kept me in bondage to that fear of death all my life. The Savior has come to deliver me of that fear. And then as I began to look at scriptures, the scriptures about healing started to pop out. By his stripes, I am healed. And then I began to look at the Gospels, and I saw that everywhere Jesus went, he healed them all. 
And I began to look at the old covenant. I began to look at all the scriptures about healing. And over time, it didn't happen overnight. Over time, I began to change my thinking about healing. And I began to meditate on God is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Jesus is the same. The Holy Spirit is the same. The scriptures are the same. The church is the same. Greater works will you, will you do because I go into the Father. And even though I had people all around me who died, family members who died of cancer, who tried everything and believed, they were believers. They believed in God's healing. They did not get healed. I still believed that in my life, I was going to see salvation, healing. I was going to see that sozo completeness of healing in the physical body. And I held firm, and I meditated on it. And one of the things I found is that as I began to meditate on it, my heart, my thinking began to change, and my words began to change. And I noticed that the people that I had been living around, I noticed that they they were very negative in their speech regarding healing. And they were afraid of death and sickness. And so my ears began to notice and, and pick that up. And I noticed that my speech was different than their speech. And sometimes they would even call me down and they say, why are you talking like that? Why are you saying that God will heal you? How can you say that? And I say, well, I, I see it in the scripture. And not just one. I see it in the Old Testament. I see it in the New Testament. And I not only see it in the Gospels, I see it in the book of Acts. And I see it in the letters of the apostles. I see it everywhere. And I hear about it overseas on the mission field. People are having heal all kinds of wonderful healings. And then I began to experience supernatural deliverance and healings. And I told you all about my son who was in the bicycle accident, who walked away from a terrible bicycle accident with a tiny little scratch on his cheek, it was actually on his ear. And what they said would be an enormous shiner on his face. And that was on a Thursday. And two days later, you would have never known the boy was ever in an accident. There was no bruising, no um, swelling, healed. He was miraculously healed. That was just one of the healings that I have experienced since meditating on these scriptures, re changing my thinking, changing my speech, and then the conduct follows. That's one example I have lots of examples where meditating on the word, changing my thinking, letting my heart be renewed to God's word, letting my speech that comes out of my mouth that reflects my, my changed heart, and then the conduct, the wonderful fruit that comes from that. So Jesus is saying, this is the spiritual kingdom. This is how it works. It's not what comes into the body. I'm not defiled by what comes into my body. I'm defiled by polluted speech, which brings forth polluted actions. And what's the remedy? Get a new heart. Get a new heart. And how do you get a new heart? By Jesus Christ. Accepting Jesus Christ. Believing that what he did on the cross gives me a new heart. And I confess it out loud. And I ask him to give me that clean heart. You know, David begged God, give me a clean heart. Give me a new heart. Clean up my heart. And that's what the new covenant is. That's what this kingdom, this new kingdom, it's the clean heart. And so therefore you can walk in righteousness all the time because your heart's fresh, your heart's new. The words will come forth and the conduct will come forth. Brand new way of thinking. A paradigm shift. Paradigm shift. It takes the Holy Spirit to get a revelation of this and walk in it. So we see rejection by the nation, rejection by the leaders. And here comes a Gentile woman in verse 21. Then Jesus went hence and departed unto the coast of Tyre and Sidon. We know Tyre and Sidon are very evil cities. And you can go look in Ezekiel and you can see where God prophesies to the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre. Evil people. Evil regimes. And behold, a woman of Canaan. She's a Gentile outside the covenant of Israel. She is not Jewish. 
she came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. She's calling him Lord. Thou son of David. So she's calling him what the Israelites were calling him, son of David, Messiah. And what is she saying? I'm a Jew. I believe she was masquerading as a Jew. So desperate for Jesus' salvation that she's trying to masquerade as a Jew by saying, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Now, again, from the 1970s, we remember those movies about the devil. The Exorcist being one, I don't recommend anybody ever watch that movie. But I came from the generation that watched those movies. We, we didn't know better. But we watch those terrible movies, and we it glorifies Satan, and it's not accurate of Scripture, of the authority that the church has. But regardless, um, we saw a picture in those movies of people grievously afflicted by demons. And I have seen that since in my walk with the Lord in ministry. People grievously afflicted by the devils. And, um, and... This mother is desperate. And any of us as parents, we know what that's like. When your child is writhing in pain and uh, uh, grievously vexed and they are begging for deliverance and you can't do a thing about it, you're on your knees. You're begging for an answer. And this woman is desperate. She's not a Jew. Jesus is coming to Israel. Remember in Daniel's 70 weeks, 77-year period, the 490-year period, God was going to um, uh, minister to Israel his righteousness. And we are in the last week of that 70-week period. It was not yet time for Jesus to go to the Gentiles yet. Through the Apostle Paul. He is preaching to Israel. And so she knows that. I believe this woman knows that. She knows that he's ministering to Israel. And he's all those who are maybe living in that region who are Israelites who need to hear the gospel. And that's why he's there. And she's so desperate for what Jesus has to offer because of her daughter. So desperate. And she's crying out. I believe she's yelling at the top of her lungs, begging for mercy. And then said Jesus, uh, uh, hold on, uh, wrong, 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 hold on. Um, she, he answers her, not a word. So Jesus, he doesn't say a word to her. And this may seem very mean, but he's not being mean. He's making a point. The point is, it's not time yet for the Gentiles. I'm on a schedule that has been laid out by the Heavenly Father, not yet time for the Gentiles to receive this message. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. I'm sure they were telling her, Hush up, get away, leave us alone, scoot, go on, you know. And she's begging and crying out, Oh, oh Lord, son of David, Deliver my daughter who is grievously vexed by demons. Deliver her, deliver her. And she's crying out and she's making such a ruckus that um, the disciples are having to go to Jesus to deal with her. And his answer is, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he's fulfilling Daniel's 70th week. He's fulfilling all of his scriptures. Go to Israel first. Then came she and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. So somehow she got up there to Jesus. She may have pressed her way through the crowd, pressed her way through those disciples, or either that or maybe the disciples said, let's just get her up here and let him deal with her. And she worships him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and he said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, let the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, Great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. All right, I'm going to stop right there and make a couple of comments about this. She knew that this message was not for her. But yet, 
she knows that even in the natural realm, dogs get the crumbs from the children's table. And she's calling herself a dog. She's saying, I know I'm outside the covenant. I know that in the Jewish community, I'm considered a dog. I am not worthy of what you're, at, what you're offering. But I know that if you can just give me the crumb from the table, that will do the job. And you know, this woman was so desperate for what was being offered. And yet Israel was being offered all of the bread in its fullness. And yet they're rejecting it. They're being invited to come to the table and to eat the figurative spiritual table and eat what the Savior is offering. And they're shunning it and pushing it away. But yet this woman outside the covenant so desperate is saying, I know I'm not worthy to eat that food that they're rejecting, but just give me a little crumb that you would cast off to the dogs. That'll do it. And he said, oh, woman, great is your faith. You get it. She gets it. She gets it. That even the leftovers, so to speak, the rejected parts of this are enough to give her deliverance for her daughter. And I think if all of us would stop and re-examine what we have been given in this gospel, how precious this gospel is, that she would, would risk everything for a crumb, that, uh, you know, I see missionaries, pictures of missionaries, and they get Bibles. Their Bibles are banned in their countries. And they get Bibles, and they're kissing the Bibles, and they're hugging the Bibles. And it's so precious to them. The Word of God is so precious to them. And so we've lost a little bit of that in North America. You know, I can get Scripture on my phone. I can get it on my iPad and whatnot. But it is so precious. It is a precious, precious Word, and it's powerful. And we need to sometimes re-examine how precious this word is and how it changes lives. So I'll stop there. Meditate on all this. Be blessed and um, ask the Heavenly Father for the wonderful things. If you've been eating the crumbs, ask him for the full bread. Ask him to put you at the table and allow you to eat fully. Eat till you're full and then for him to show you where to send the leftovers so that others will be blessed. I'll see you next time. Have a blessed day.